I'm honored to announce that I am appointing LaVon Griffin Valade to be Oregon's next Secretary of State. After a two-month search, Oregon Governor Tina Kotak officially announces her pick for the next Secretary of State. LaVon Griffin Valade will serve for the remaining 18 months of the current term. This comes after former Secretary of State Shamia Fagan resigned in early May following a scandal in her office. K2's Ricardo Lewis was at today's announcement and his life force in southeast Portland with a look at the selection process. Ricardo? Well, Governor Kotek says she took her time with this decision, and this was all happening during a chaotic legislative session. The new Secretary of State now has a big job of ahead of her uh, working on the public's trust. During a tumultuous legislative session and then a bombshell scandal dropped on the Oregon Secretary of State's office, Governor Tina Kotek was left with a tough decision to make. I told Oregonians back in May that the primary objective of our next Secretary of State would be to restore confidence in the office of the Secretary of State. On Wednesday afternoon, Governor Kotek tapped LaVon Griffin Valet to replace former Secretary of State Shamia Fagan. Fagan resigned in early May following reporting that revealed she was moonlighting as a high paid private consultant for the cannabis company Lamoda. The governor says she had a lot of names in mind, but Griffin Valet is the person she thought of early on. She has built a strong reputation as a public servant who was honest and has unquestioned integrity. Griffin Valade worked as a government performance auditor for over 16 years, including eight years as an elected auditor for both the city of Portland and Multnomah County. Accountability, transparency, and the ability to restore the public's faith will be just some of the top priorities Griffin Valade will have to live up to. She believes she can. She wasn't there for the governor's announcement, but in a statement, she says it's never been more important to have a leader who will focus on rebuilding the public's trust in the Secretary of State's office, and that is exactly what I will aim to do every day. Now I think we have to have extra scrutiny on everything they're doing there because the public has lost confidence because of the action of one elected leader. Now it's still unclear if the new Secretary of State is looking to be in this uh, position long term. She'll be sworn in on Friday. We're live in Southeast Portland. Ricardo Lewis, K2 News. Okay, Ricardo, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. I want to start off today um, with my announcement around the Secretary of State. I'm honored to announce that I am appointing LaVon Griffin Valade to be Oregon's next Secretary of State. I told Oregonians back in May that the primary objective of our next Secretary of State would be to restore confidence in the office of the Secretary of State. I took my time, and after taking the time to evaluate this very critical decision, I feel strongly that LaVon Griffin Valade is the right person to meet this moment and regain Oregonians' faith in their government. I know LaVon Griffin Valade first and foremost from her experience holding government leaders accountable, her ethical judgment, and her reputation as a leader with a steady hand who rises above politics. Accountability and transparency are precisely what this role demands at this moment after the scandal in that office. And I'm eager to see her leadership restore confidence in the Secretary of State's office. As a government, as a government performance auditor for over 16 years, including eight years, as an elected auditor, she oversaw a work that required a high level of independence and ethical judgment from managers and staff. Some of the work she has done included government performance auditing, elections, archives, an ombuds office, and additional accountability functions, very much in line with what the functions of the Secretary of State are. She has built a strong reputation as a public servant who was honest and has un questioned integrity. The proof of this was in her work, where she has time and again shown an impeccable track record for holding government leaders accountable and asking hard questions to get to the truth. That is why the state of Oregon needs her right now in this office now more than ever. I also want to personally thank LaVon for taking on this role. She is stepping up to the call for public service, and I want to thank her and her family 
for the commitment they are going to make to the state of Oregon over the next year and a half. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Governor, when did you uh, decide yeah. on her? Um, I gather that she's not planning to run for election. And why did you think that a temporary appointment was appropriate? Well, let me first talk about the process a little bit. So obviously, we're in the middle of legislative session dealing with the walkout when Secretary of State resigned. My first step in that process was to talk to a lot of people. What do we need in that office? It wasn't so much about the person, but what qualities and experience did we need to see for the next Secretary of State? And LaVon was one of the people I thought of early, but I had a lot of names, people I was thinking about, but you know, we were in the middle of session. As session was running to a close, I started to focus on her as uh, an excellent appointment choice. Um, and I think you'll have a chance to meet her on Friday um, for her swearing in. The question of whether or not she's interested in the long term, I just want to be very clear. After the Secretary of State, when Secretary Fagan stepped down, I was given legal advice that I would not be allowed to discuss future plans. That cannot be a condition of appointment. I know there was a lot of conversation about that. That is undue influence. I can get you the legal statute if you need to see it. But that was not a conversation we had. That is a question you need to ask her of whether she is interested in pursuing it. Right now, I'm focused on making sure she is appointed to restore confidence in that office, making sure she has the whole lay of the land, and I look forward to her leadership in doing that. I have a question from Emily Harris with Actors Portland. What, if any, or specific ways you would like to change or refine the method of funding the legislature's improvement approved for the I-5 bridge replacement going forward, and why? What specific oversights and conditions for the billion dollars would you like to add, and should that legislation or ODOT be, or should that be Decisions made by the legislature or ODOT. And I'm sorry, who was this? Was Axios? Yep, Axios. Well, first of all, I appreciate the national intention on the replacing of the I-5 bridge. This is a project of national importance. Um, I am pleased that the legislature was able to identify the billion-dollar commitment, so we can match what the state of Washington is doing, and we can move forward on applying for federal grants. We cannot do this project without federal support, and the, the step in this session was to make that commitment for a billion dollars. Um, where there will be an initial $250 million in the next biennium by general obligation bonds. We did make the commitment over the course of the next four biennia to reach the billion-dollar goal. We will be bringing in a uh, transportation package in the 2025 session. I assume there will be more conversations. Right now, I'm comfortable with where we are in our funding commitment to the bridge. And in terms of the details of how that project will go forward, there will be more conversations about the bridge. Um, this focus on the session was about making that financial commitment that has been made. We need to replace the bridge. It is a safety issue uh, that we need to address. And I'm glad that we are locked up with Washington State, going to our federal partners to ask for the support we need to do the project. Uh, Governor, did you identify anything in the Secretary of State's office before the scandal happened that you wanted to improve on? Um, and you see that in this new person that you're bringing forward today. Thank you for the question. To be honest, um, prior to the scandal that erupted with the Secretary of State Fagan, I, I was confident that things were fine, uh, had been paying much attention. I, that's an independent office. Um, what I would say is now I think we have to have extra scrutiny on everything they're doing there because the public has lost confidence because of the action of one elected leader. So through this appointment, LaVon is going to be focused on looking at how things are running from all the different aspects, elections, audits, uh, small business support, archives, making sure that everything is running well. And I will leave it to her discretion if she needs to make any changes. Yeah. Uh, Governor, uh, on House Bill 3414, as you know, that died. Uh, Two-part question, how does that affect your, your goals for housing and homelessness in Oregon? And uh, where does that issue go from here? Thank you for the question. I do believe the legislature made good progress with the funding and some of the policy work, both on homelessness and housing during the session. But as many of you know, I'm never satisfied and we have more work to do and I've said that. I think part of that conversation is land supplies relates to what was trying to get done in House Bill 3414. I've been very clear with folks. 
we need to think about how we're doing things in Oregon. The status quo is not getting the job done, and we have a large production target we have to meet. So my staff is evaluating what was accomplished in the session. I have more than 300 bills to look at right now in budgets. So once we've had a sense of the lay of the land, then we will develop next steps of how we come back to that conversation and other conversations that will help us with housing supply because we need to build more housing. So when I follow up on that, um, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been committed, um, money that you had asked for from the legislature and they gave to help work on solving the homelessness situation. What kind of assurances can you make to the public that they're going to see a difference? Because a lot of that money gets passed through different organizations, different agencies. What difference are people going to see, especially on the streets? Well, first of all, I welcome those hard questions because it's not enough to assign money and to say you're going to do things. You have to have to see progress. We got the money early in session under the emergency order. We have been working on a regular basis with the local communities that have specific plans to increase shelter capacity, to keep people housed, and to rehouse people between now and the end of the year. So we are staying on top of that. Um, I fully expect we will hit those goals. We'll see more shelter availability. We'll see fewer people on the streets, and it's not going to be easy. We need all Oregonians stepping up to do that work. I also want to praise the legislature because it wasn't enough to do the $200 million at the beginning of session. We have to follow through on our commitment, which means for the rest of the biennium, we'll have the dollars we need to maintain those shelters and more shelter beds that we are building uh, and putting online. Um, there will be more dollars to prevent um, people from becoming homeless in the first place by rent and assistance and other prevention efforts. And we're focusing on rehousing people as well. So this is a full bore, all hands on deck approach. And now the session's over, we don't let up. We are having conversations every day with communities of how they can address this issue locally. And I wanna see progress. Yeah, so um, on 3414, I think you all know there was, a, there was a deal to have Republicans come back to provide quorum. And I have to say, that six-week walkout from Republicans who chose to walk off the job really impacted the whole session. Um, you all saw a rush here at the end of session to get things done, and I'm glad we did that. I did not want to have a special session to fix the budget, um, so we got our budgets done, which was very important. Um, one of the pieces of the agreement for... Uh, Senate Republicans and independents to come back was to make a good faith effort to pass 3414 um, with the land supply portion. I made a commitment personally to be part of trying to pass it. So I worked in the last 72 hours to talk to members to try to get their votes. And on the day of the floor, I thought we would pass the bill. We didn't. That happens. That doesn't mean we aren't coming back on the topic. So I upheld my side of the bargain, which was to try to get it done. Um, and we need to continue the conversation. Um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to see the Ombudsman's report from the city of Portland that came out last week regarding that dozens of immigrants were denied the U visa, which is uh, immigrant victims of certain crimes can be granted uh, special visas, so they can't be deported. Um, what's your opinion on that? And also, do you think that the lack of accountability of that PPD in this case has, do you think that creates a, a bigger gap of trust between the immigrant community and law enforcement to come forward with these crimes and to be uh, feel com comfortable that these crimes will be attended to? Thank you for the question. I have not read the report, other I've just seen the, the news coverage of the concern from the auditor's office. I do think it creates a chilling effect when the goal of that uh, exceptional visa uh, or uh, immigration um, allowance is to make sure people come forward when they have been victims or have been witnesses to victims or have seen crimes being committed. Um, I think it, it impacts our ability to keep our community safe. As governor, I would like to make sure law enforcement across the state is consistently applying that because we need everyone in our community to come forward and feel safe to come forward to identify when crimes are committed because that keeps us all safe. So hopefully um, PPB will respond positively to that audit and uh, address accordingly their, their failures there. So. I have a question from Central Oregon Daily News, Gustavo Bautista. Uh, during a story on the passage of House Bill 2426, the pump your own gas bill and its impact on Central Oregon, the question for you, do you intend to sign this bill and what ultimately made you decide to do it? Are you ready to pump your own gas? 
Thank you. Uh, this is one of those bills from the session I think is gathering uh, a lot of attention. Um, I have not made a commitment either way on that bill. Uh, of the 300 plus bills, I have to look at them, consider all the testimony. If people want to weigh in on any of the bills that are before me now that they're out of the legislature, you can go to our website. There's a spot to say, share your opinion. So if you have an opinion about that bill or any other bill, please let me know. I have 30 days in which to either sign or veto the bill. Governor, I'd like to ask a, a follow-up back on 3414. You were at the Capitol on, yeah, on Sunday uh, talking with some legislators after it went down in case there could be a, a revote. Um, what happened? I understand there were a couple of Democrats who were supposed to vote for the bill who didn't. So can you describe, you know, kind of what happened and their response when you tried to intervene? Well, Dick, I know, I mean, you know, I um, was a legislator for 15 years, so very aware of the kind of give and take at the end of session. A lot of people going back and forth on the bill. Um, I thought I had commitments um, to get the votes we needed. Uh, Republicans were able to muster eight votes. I thought we could get eight votes from uh, the Senate Democratic Caucus to pass the bill. Um, and my job was to see if there was an opportunity for reconsideration. Um, if you have any other questions about that, you should probably bring them up with leadership. All I know is we don't have the bill. I'm going to work hard to figure out how we get back to that topic because the session's over, but the topic is not going away. So, so to that, you didn't have Democrats um, put across the line, and it seems like it was the yes thing to do and not be um, specific enough to affordable housing and anything being built on this land was what I read. Is that, was that the fatal flaw, or what was the reason that you couldn't get it? Well, I did watch the floor. There was a variety of perspectives on why they, um, senators would not support the bill. But we had quite a few Senate Democrats who did support the bill. And um, at the end of the day, we were one short. And um, I'm going to listen to what those concerns were and see if we can adjust. But let's be clear, um, also one of the challenges was we didn't have all the Senate Republicans back because some of them, because of what had happened over the course of the session, were not coming back. So uh, that also affected the vote count. What I'm doing right now is assessing what the legislature did achieve as it relates to our housing crisis, particularly as it relates to housing supply. There were several policy bills, there were investments that we had called for and other folks had called for to help get more construction in the pipeline. After that assessment is done, I'm gonna see what do we need to do next? And I'm open to all options because housing is a crisis I don't know if you caught on to that yet. We don't have enough housing. I'm going to keep talking about housing, and I will do whatever it takes to make sure we can get more supply in the pipeline. And you've been very patient. <laughs> Back to transportation. The Transportation Commission met this morning, and ODOT has said in the last couple of days specifically that your delay in allowing them to implement tooling is going to raise costs for a number of projects and delay them potentially indefinitely. What do you expect to happen in the next two years, and how are you seeing ODOT pay for projects they say are necessary, especially on I-5 and 205? Thank you. Um, I know that uh, under my direction, ODOT has put together an analysis of where we are with the major projects um, that were funded in House Bill, the, the transportation package back in 2017. Um, it was the right call to put a pause on the um, collection of tolls as it related to I-205. Um, I also believe that we will need to get there, but doing it right is important. That being said, we need to have an honest conversation about where our revenues are to do the major projects, like the Rose Quarter. And I wanna be transparent with people. If we have a revenue problem, then let's have a conversation. We will have a transportation package in 2025. Um, I do believe the Rose Quarter has to get done, but as you're hearing from the conversation at the Oregon Transportation Commission this morning, we don't have the resources identified yet to do that. We got to get serious about that, and um, I think there's an idea that all that money is there. It is not. We have to do these projects right. I'm committed to doing that. We'll just have to figure it out. I'm not sure what the 100 million is that you mean for higher ed? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, here's what I would say about all the bills that ended up session, including the final six bills that wrap up the session. 
bonding, capital construction. I have to look at all of them. I will look at them line by line to see if I agree with the allocations that were made. And um, I haven't had a chance to do that yet. So. I'm not aware that OSU, OSU Cascades did receive any funding. Can I ask you a question about a couple of items that um, didn't get funding? Um, the Warrior Crime Victims Law Center, a million dollars, 43% of their budget. Um, I feel like they fell through the cracks. And the arts and culture topics didn't get what they were looking for from however the museum and venue for the Shakespeare Festival. Um, from almost $12 million. Did those things fall through the cracks? Is there any recourse for those folks, and especially the crime victim law center, which really is historically counted on that funding? Yeah, um, again, I think this goes to the dynamic at the end of the session because of the walkout. Um, even though there was a lot of good work done, when you are focused on also getting people back to work, you, you, you know, some things will get lost in the fray. Um, I think and every session you have things that get missed. And what normally happens is leadership will say, we'll be back and do this in February. I would assume for the crime victims resources, there's a lot of commitment there. I, that has truly slipped through the cracks. I'm not aware that there was any concern. I didn't even know it was an issue. Um, and I do think for other things, people will always come back, right? We, everybody doesn't get what they need at every session, so I fully expect if some of the things that people wanted funded didn't happen, they will be back in the February session. Governor, um, regarding the legislative session, uh, we spoke to uh, supporters of SB 610, which is Good for All Oregonians, and members from the Oregon Workers uh, Relief Fund, and they have mentioned to me in the last couple of days that they feel they either not receive the support that they uh, expected, especially since these programs uh, are directed to immigrant programs, for example, Oregon Relief Fund, Workers Relief Fund has a program of climate change where workers can get salary if they decide not to go to work because of smoke or extreme heat. So what do you have to say uh, about the amount of funding that goes to immigrant programs? Like, do you feel like the state is funding these uh, enough? Well, again, still analyzing where all the budgets ended up. I didn't see some of these budgets until they were posted for passage in the Ways and Means Committee. So still looking at them. I've been a strong supporter of the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. I think they've done good, accountable, impactful work. Um, I also believe that legislative leaders in the budget committees were focused on other things. I was very focused on housing and homelessness and behavioral health and our early literacy package. That doesn't mean these things aren't important. I think we'll have to come back and have another conversation with the budget writers. I will say that they left a lot of money on the table at the end of session. Um, like every other bill, I, I might have to take the full month for all these bills, so I, I can't give you a, a timeline of when that one in particular will be figured out. Well, we have 300 plus bills, um, and I probably will take them in order, so I, I don't know when I will get to that. And I want to hear from Oregonians. Um, I grew up in a place where I pumped gas. I, I've lived here a long time. What do people think? Um, this is a big decision. For, for a lot of people, this means a lot, so I hope they're going to let me know. Um, and I will take that into account when I'm making my decision. So, yes? Um, you talked a little about, about the impact that the walkout uh, had on the session, and of course, a lot uh, within 10 days we had hundreds of bills. But I'm just, you know, first let me take the session as governor, what your summary of, of the session would be, and how you move forward um, from a walkout that got, you know, long ago. I think most folks who watch the legislature knew that a um, lot of new members, relatively new leadership in some places, it was going to be, you know, a little different when you have long-term presiding officers like myself and Senate President Peter Courtney stepping down. I want to say I think legislators did a good job in very uh, difficult situations. Um, again, we have our budgets. We have good policy. I think things that are going to help Oregonians got done. The dynamic of the walkout was significant. Um, it really put everything on pause for almost six weeks. And that is hard when you're trying to get things done and be as, um, you know, focused and, and diligent as you can be. Um, I will give you one example. I was very clear with legislative leaders that we needed to get campaign finance reform done this session. I had a bill, speaker had a bill. 
it didn't get done because I don't think there was enough energy to focus on something like that when you're dealing with the walkout. So the walkout did have an impact on something as large as campaign finance reform. Um, my hope is that by the end of session, um, relationships were being restored that we can have a better working relationship. But you got to understand, Senate Republicans and independents walked out and feel like they weren't treated well. I hope that that feeling does not carry over into the next session because we need to have a session next year. Uh, Governor, uh, have you identified any policy or budget bills that you're planning to veto? Uh, not yet. Again, literally, we are just sitting down to look at all the bills. Um, a lot happened, um, and I, my team reads every bill. I read every bill, so you know, I don't have any yay or nay yet at this point on any of the bills. So. Governor, to follow up on Diane's question, um, what do you think you did well as governor during the legislative session, and what will you do differently going forward? It's a really great question. Obviously, my first session as governor, my focus was to stay as disciplined on the, t on the priorities of the state, housing and homelessness, behavioral health, education, particularly around early literacy. And I think we did that. Um, we tried not to get too much into the legislature's business. I'm not a legislator. I'm not you know, the 91st legislator. I'm the governor. So I was very much focused on let's work on the things that are priorities um, and not get involved in a lot of different things. I did try to have an impact and work from behind the scenes to make sure we could resolve the walkout. And legislative leaders had to do the heavy lift, and they did. So I think working on that partnership with legislative leaders is important to me to make sure we can continue to work together. Um, I look forward to the next sessions because I will have more time to have my own bills drafted. Um, we didn't have that going into session. I had to rely on legislators in most cases to draft my priority bills. Um, that will be different. and. Um, I think that will give me more time to actually have the type of legislation from day one that we need. So. I have a question from Jamie Goldberg with the Oregonian. Regarding your literacy package, is the Department of Education saying money, training, and new materials, uh, or the Department of Education is saying that money, training, and new materials likely won't reach schools until March? Are you content with that piece? One of the things that's important for me on early literacy is, first of all, we passed a really good bill and legislature put money behind it. As some of the reporting has shown, we've tried to improve early literacy in the past. I wanna make sure we're being deliberate, that we're setting up the systems in every school district to make sure teachers have the skills to teach the science of reading and that every child can be successful. I just had a meeting just this week, um, maybe even yesterday, I'm losing track of time already, about well, what comes next. So. Districts are going to start getting understanding of what they need to do. Uh, we're gonna have rules drafted to make sure the money is getting to the districts. We need to come back and also get the additional resources for students um, or for the community groups and really young readers, birth to five, working with community groups. I want everyone in Oregon to understand that reading is absolutely essential. So every parent, every professional, Every educator, we're gonna be talking a lot about reading. You're probably gonna see me on the road talking a lot about reading. This isn't just a bill. This isn't just about a little bit more money. This is about changing a mindset of how we do instruction in our schools. We're also standing up the Educator Preparation Council, which is going to talk about what our education programs are teaching our future educators and what they are learning. So we are planning for the long haul. So it's the short term, training up as best we can, get the money to the districts, getting our new educators properly trained, and really changing what we do here in the state when it comes to teaching reading. And we are all in on that. Um, and, and the bill that was passed in 3198 is a great start. Senator, you, going back to the Secretary of State's office, you talked about the main priority is accountability and ensuring trust. Is there specific, uh, and you touched on it a little bit, but I just wanted to know, is there specific goals in the next 18 months that you really want to see I did not make specific asks. Um, what I said to um, LaVon is, I need your expertise. I need you to take your experience and say, how is the office doing? Where are we now? 
we're still going to be, I think, dealing with the aftermath of the scandal and a, what she should be doing, but I need her to make sure we have an office that people can have confidence in, and that might have to be changes. We just don't know yet. So. Is there a reason she's not here today, or are we waiting until Friday to hear from her? Um, on Friday. Today we wanted to announce uh, she'll be sworn in on Friday. Um, the Secretary of State's office will be dealing with the, the details of the swearing-in now that it's been announced. So um, we'll do it Friday. She'll get sworn in. I believe she'll be re making remarks, so you'll get to meet her then. You know, I don't have any updates. Um, you know, uh, the Attorney General is completing, I, continuing on in her investigation. I have not had any updates from the Attorney General, which is fairly common. You know, she's going to stay tight-lipped until, you know, to protect the investigation. Um, I have not heard, I know that the Ethics Commission is taking up the topic, um, so they will have their process. So it's going to be a couple months, I think, before we have any conclusion on either one of those investigations. Is there something you want to see, or is it you're expecting these to happen? I want the truth to come out, and I want people to understand the whole story and understand what we learn from this going forward. Um, when a scandal happens, hopefully we learn from it and keep it from happening in the future. All right, thank you. I appreciate everyone. Um, have a great day. And as always, if you need a follow up, you know where to find my team. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. We'll see you, some of you, on Friday, probably. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.